Last Saturday, a group of us from Grace Church joined with other Presbyterians from National Capital Presbytery in the Pride Parade in DC. We were a motley crew. I'm looking out at some of the motley crew right now and right here. We were a motley crew of young and old decked out in various Presbyterian t-shirts, our green ones from Grace, many wearing light blue ones with the Presbyterian insignia. As we marched in line with colorful floats and festive party goers, our Presbyterian contingent was happy and joyful and full of good cheer, but on our own frozen, chosen kind of way. There was one young man among us who was carrying a giant rainbow flag and he jogged along and he waved the flag at the crowds and he was definitely the life of, of our party. As our group gathered, I met a woman from Burke Presbyterian Church. Her outfit, like the rest of us, was unremarkable. Everyday street clothes. But she did have one accessory a large button pinned to her shirt that read free mom hugs free mom hugs and she would run up to the people who were lining the parade route and she would ask them if they wanted a hug and they would joyfully accept it. and then there would be this big embrace of perfect strangers and I watched her as she would go from person to person and ask. I couldn't hear. I was out in the, you know, the middle of the street, but I could see her along the way, just bouncing along, running along. Do you want a hug? I mean, I could, you, know, you could see what she was saying, and they would go, yeah. and she would hug them. And as we were walked on past down the route, I looked back, and I had seen her kind of gesture to one woman, you know, do you want a hug? And clearly the woman had nodded, yes. Yeah. And she had embraced her. And then I saw the woman almost in tears afterwards, this young woman gesturing to her, the person who was with her as if to say, can you believe that? She just gave me a hug. It was just a hug. But it was both simple and profound. What was great about this act, this simple deed, it is that it was an act of compassion. Returning to our scripture passage, it starts out in verse 35 with a summary of Jesus' ministry, preaching, teaching, healing as he travels from place to place. And he attracted a following. When he saw the crowds, huge crowds who had gathered around, we read, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When Jesus saw the people, he was full of compassion. He was moved by compassion. The shepherd and sheep imagery that we find here in this passage harkens back to Old Testament images of God's people as sheep and their leaders as shepherds. In Ezekiel 34, we find a scathing indictment of the religious leaders, spoken by the prophet Ezekiel when he was in exile in Babylon along with his fellow Israelites. No words are minced, as Ezekiel reports. The word of the Lord came to me, mortal, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, Prophesy and say to them, to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, you shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fatted calves, but you do not feed the sheep. You have not strengthened the weak, you have not healed the sick. You have not bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays. You have not sought the loss. But with force and harshness, you have ruled them. 
If we're looking for the modern day equivalent of the shepherds of Israel, that would be the religious leaders of today. In the Presbyterian church, leadership is somewhat fluid and non-hierarchical, but if we were to identify leaders, we would say the pastors and elders. So, looking around for a couple of quick examples, I would say that's me, and honestly, Warren. Raise your hand, yeah, so it's the pastors and the elders. But moving right along from that, the prophet has hard words for pretty much everybody. He goes on. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture, but you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture? When you drink of clear water, must you foul the rest with your feet? And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have fouled with your feet? The Israelites in exile and their leaders and religious leaders and all of us together are indicted on the same charge. Failure to act with compassion. And we must admit that at least at times we do fail. We get sidetracked, we get busy, we get overwhelmed. We occasionally dismiss, sometimes judge, overlook, maybe ignore. But mostly, I think what we do is adjust. We shift our expectations downward to meet the reality of the world as it is, and we live more or less comfortably in that space. But the good news is that God doesn't leave us there. In the muddle of angst and complacency that is ours, God doesn't give up on us for our failures. God takes over where we, shepherds and sheep alike, fall short. God also promises through Ezekiel, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strays, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. I will make with them a covenant of peace, they shall know that I, the Lord their God, am with them. You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, says the Lord. And then this imagery carries over into the New Testament where Jesus, as God incarnate, is the shepherd, the good shepherd, who is moved by compassion as he surveys the helpless and hapless sheep. Out of compassion for the people, Jesus urges his disciples to pray for more laborers, more workers and helpers, to meet the needs of those he sees all around him. And then voila, prayers are answered in the next verse as Jesus calls these 12 disciples or apostles to join him in his mission and to do the very things that he does to proclaim the good news, cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. These regular, ordinary people, fishermen, a tax collector thrown into the mix, these ordinary people are bestowed with the power and authority to act in Jesus' name and do the same acts of compassion that he did. Matthew's readers in the early church and we readers of Matthew and followers of Jesus today, all of us, disciples, are also tasked with carrying on the ministry described here. With the presence and power of the Good Shepherd, we are called to act with compassion in the world in which we live, which is also the realm, the kingdom of God. We're called to demonstrate that the kingdom of God has indeed drawn near. 
the parenthetical word about the mission described in this passage, in telling his disciples not to go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans, Jesus limits the scope of the disciples' ministry for a time. But later in Matthew, the resurrected Jesus tells the disciples to go into all the world. The mission field then is no less than the entire world and every person in it. The needs of the crowd in Jesus' day were overwhelming, as witnessed by how many people flocked to him for help and healing. And of course, that is no less the case today. With news always available to us, we are acutely aware, even if we try to tune it out, that the earth and its inhabitants are struggling in a multitude of ways. In our day and age, the news is always right at our fingertips. Maybe you're right at your fingertips right now, especially if you're watching online. And if so, put your phone down. I'm talking. <laughs> this week, we marked some important days and commemorations, as Warren has said, including Father's Day and Juneteenth. Maybe less well-known, June 20th is World Refugee Day as designated by the United Nations in 2001. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees offers these stark statistics. In the first months of 2022, so last year, the number of people forced to flee war, violence, and persecution worldwide surpassed 100 million for the first time. It's a staggering number. But it's only a number. It's a number that it's hard for us to wrap our heads around and thus easy to ignore until we see the human faces that that number represents. And we in our congregation have seen and know and gotten to know the human beings that that number represents in our Afghan friends. This week, we witness what some are saying may turn out to be the biggest or one of the biggest migrant catastrophes in the Mediterranean Sea ever, which is saying a lot since there have been many, many migrant catastrophes in the Mediterranean Sea. When a boat carrying an untold number of migrants, men, women, children, possibly 750 people, according to witnesses, this boat capsized in the sea, and heartbreaking images of missing relatives put a human face on the numbers. Closer to home, in Florida and elsewhere, the US, in the US, the human toll of mass migration is seen and felt. Immigration issues along our southern border in the U.S. provide constant opportunities for heated conversation, controversy, and conflict, but also for compassion. A conservative evangelical church in Florida opened its doors to migrants to sleep on air mattresses in their Sunday school rooms and use their portable showers in the parking lot underneath, as a reporter pointed out, a sign saying, God is love. The article I saw explained that the pastor of the church and many other Latino pastors, quote, support strict enforcement of the U.S.-Mexico border hundreds of miles away, but they and members of their congregations feel compelled to help migrants in their communities, regardless of their legal status. And a pastor interviewed said, I can't turn my back on someone who needs food because they don't have documents. And whatever specific plans or policies or programs one considers for, for addressing immigration and other interconnected issues, Christians are called to think and act with compassion, to look into the eyes of the suffering and see there the image of God in every single human being. 
It's not a prescription for a specific public policy, but it is a mindset, a heart set, if you will, that we are called to have as Jesus followers wherever we are and whatever we're doing. The needs are overwhelming if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. But I hear Jesus' words elsewhere in Scripture comforting and encouraging us as we bumble along. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus calls us modern-day disciples and sends us out maybe far out, or maybe just out the door, or outside our mental comfort zone. Jesus sends us out in his name and with his authority and power, his very presence to sustain and guide and strengthen us along our way. Sharon Dreyer, church member Sharon Dreyer and I were talking last week at the Honduras Fiesta. Now Sharon would be sitting right there in the Dreyer pew today but we'll give her a pass because she's off celebrating her birthday with her family. So. I mentioned that I would be preaching this week, and Sharon said that she had just recently come across an ancient text among her old papers, a sermon that she had preached at Grace back in the day. To date that more specifically, it was after cars, but before the World Wide Web, and I know this because I had just started as associate pastor at Grace at the time. I wasn't here the Sunday she preached because I was off in Oregon busy getting ordained. I asked Sharon if she would share with me the sermon that she had just unearthed in her papers and she was kind enough to make a copy and give me permission to share a bit of it with you. In her message, Sharon talked about her time serving as a volunteer with the Presbyterian Mission Board using her nursing skills in Ethiopia. She writes, I stepped out of a small motorboat onto the banks of the Barrow River into the jungle clearing that was the American Presbyterian Mission in Pokwo, Ethiopia. And then she tells this story. I remember Opio. Opio was a tiny baby. Opio's mother, Thutha, had come to the door one afternoon with two handfuls of humanity. Opio and her tiny twin, Ocean. Preemies weighing less than two pounds each. Thutha said, the wisdom of the village is that I put them in the river because they are so small they cannot live but I have brought them to you instead. In the United States at that time, those babies would have been whisked off to intensive care, placed in an incubator with the right mix of oxygen, moisture, warm air, high-tech nutrition, and still not had much chance of survival. They were simply too small. But what to do? No incubator, no oxygen, the doctor I, that is Sharon, spoke with on the radio that afternoon said that they would not live, but I had to try. A reason that my year working in pediatric intensive care must count for something. We made an incubator out of a cardboard box, lined the box with plastic bottles filled with warm water and covered with cloth for heat. I taught Thutha how to express her milk and bring it from the village many times a day so the babies would have the best possible nutrition. Since the babies needed constant care, I took them in their cardboard incubator with me wherever I went, to the clinic, to the hospital, the school, and home, since these babies were 24-hour duty, and we settled into our routine. Every two hours, heat water for the plastic bottles, warm Thutha's milk, insert feeding tubes, feed each twin, love them, keep them dry, pray, and before you knew it, it was time to start again. Ocean only lived five days. But opioid hung on. As you can well understand, she soon really seemed like my own, like she was Sharon's own. 
Opio thrived. She gained weight and eventually grew out of her box. She gained strength so that she could nurse and she needed no more feeding tube. She went back to the village with her mom and was a chubby, healthy eight-month-old at the time that Sharon left. With the most meager of resources, among some of the most marginalized of God's children, a follower of Jesus, Sharon, offered her training and skills to bring healing, compassion in action, a labor of love. Sharon talked about how even before she went to Ethiopia, before she was even a nurse, when she worked at Woolworths, and she pointed out that some will remember Woolworths, I do, she didn't have the funds to pay for college. She talked about how her colleagues there, the Woolworth ladies, as she fondly calls them, surprised her with a pantry full of food that she could use in her dorm room so she wouldn't have to buy a meal plan that she couldn't afford anyway. And in multiple other ways, these Woolworth ladies, these dear friends, helped launch Sharon on that path to nursing that eventually led to Ethiopia and many other places of compassion and of healing. Sharon wrote, these women doing what they described as a small thing, individually out of love, and having fun trying to find new ideas for simple dorm food, changed the life of one young lady and might made a lifelong impact. That is how an ordinary nurse from Denver found herself standing on the banks of the Barrow River in gratitude for the way God had, by sending human friends, worked in her life. The kingdom of God is near. We glimpse it when we allow the compassion of God to fill our hearts and lives and overflow to the world around us. It's seen in something as simple as a hug. We are called to be the embodiment of Jesus' love. Wherever and with whomever we find ourselves, God sends us out, maybe far away like Ethiopia or Honduras or Palestine, but also right here, right outside these doors, we take the church into the world and demonstrate that the kingdom of God is near. One compassionate thought, word, and deed at a time.